to thank our, our panelists here um, and all of you for visiting us. This has been really fantastic. This is uh, a structure that we've had going for the last few years, and this, like everything else at this conference, is Diane Laura's brainchild. So occasionally we give her a rest, so that's why I'm doing my Vanna White imitation here. It's um, but what the structure is, we've asked uh, our participants to answer four questions, which we'll show in the next slide. As well show them, yeah, the next slide. So four questions, and we've asked them to answer them with an image, okay? So we've done this in other years, but it's particularly fitting this year, of course, because we're doing art. So they've sent in an image, and then they're asked to answer the question through the image, using the image as inspiration. They'll take a couple of minutes for each image. Um, the first couple of questions are fairly straightforward, so we'll keep rolling, but we'll certainly keep lots of time for input as we get to the more complex ideas about uh, academia and how we incorporate some of these fantastic ideas we've been taking on over the last 24 hours or so. So um, yeah, without further ado, I think the, the PhD students and postdocs did a fantastic introduction about incorporating imagination and research. We've had great presentations um, over the last two days, so I won't take any more time from, from these. And we'll get started. So what will the world of tomorrow look like? So we've just got your images up there, and they're also over here if you can't, if you don't want to turn around. Um, so we've got Daniel starting us off with uh, whatever that is. <laughs> Okay, um, well, uh, thank you, Ryan, and, and, and thanks, um, Diane Lohr. Where's Diane Lohr? Yeah, I, I know uh, you will get me into trouble, so um, <laughs> at least um, now I know what type of trouble. Um, so this image um, is uh, an art piece. Um, it's a video game uh, or an interactive uh, piece by an artist called John Klima that I saw in 2003 at the Whitney Biennial. Um, and in it, uh, it, it, it's titled Ecosystem, and in it what he did is he took the prices of uh, several currencies um, in real time from an electronic exchange, and he plotted them in this kind of like sort of like a strange dystopian um, scenery um, where they look like flocks of birds, um, and if you zoom, you can see the actual number, the price of the currency. And, and so it, it really caught my imagination, um, and I felt that it really spoke to the concept that uh, finance uh, people uh, call volatility, uh, which is both, you know, building on the on the world to fly, volare, but also uh, fluctuation. And so there's now a sort of um, thinking about the ways in which uh, a future of instability and uncertainty is going to look like. Um, and I felt that this piece spoke to this need to understand and imagine a world, the world of uncertainty um, that awaits us. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I did not see birds. Well, the... <laughs> I like it. I saw a bird. <laughs> All right. So, Kevin, you are up next. What will the world of tomorrow look like? So, I think uh, this is... Maybe some of us view this as positive, maybe some of us view this as negative, but as we move from the, the physical to the digital, from products to services into the future, um, humans become more and more connected to a virtual world, a virtual world that's both electronic and simulated and an electronic, wor electronic world that mediates communication uh, between us. Um, I don't know exactly what it means to have 2,500 friends on <clears throat> LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram, uh, but, uh, but that's what I have and that's the reality of my social context right now. Um, I think that uh, earlier today it was brought up the importance of systems thinking towards sustainability. And I think that uh, one of the things I read that, that gives me hope about video games uh, is that video games have been shown to, in fact, certain video games have been shown, in fact, to increase the ability for youngsters to think in systemic ways. And so while right now we see a lot of the negative aspects of being hyper-connected and the kind of uncontrolled nature of this digital world that our children can be exposed to, um, I think as we become more intelligent uh, about this medium and how it will impact uh, really the evolution of the human brain, 
uh, I think that we will um, also develop positive aspects to this connection that um, will enable our, our populace to think more holistically about the issues in front of them. Thank you. Very optimistic ending. I thought I was going to need to go get the dream catcher. <laughs> <laughs> and Wendy, with this lovely um, I was thinking about climate change, and this is what Toronto is going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> So, we forgot the condo part. Yeah. <laughs> so due to climate change, we know that weather, weather patterns are going to change profoundly. We know that there's going to be less temperate zones. We know that there's going to be more deserts, desertification. We know that um, um, there will be profound shifts in, in sort of uh, what, what areas look like. Um, this is really Miami, and we have no idea. Probably Miami will be underwater. Um, but so I, I thought what the world of tomorrow will look like is uh, in some, some places it might look like the world of today, only relocated, but it's going to look profoundly different in many parts of the world. So. Thank you. Is that Toronto? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Close, you're going to do this one? Who actually this? recognizes this? <laughs> Might be a generational thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, too, yeah. Yeah. So this is the cover of um, one of my, when I was young, which is a while ago, uh, one of my favorites been The Talking Heads. Yeah. Um, it's the cover of um, uh, Once in a Lifetime, one of the greatest hits, and it's mostly known for the, the um, chorus line, which is same as it ever was. Um, and the video and the song is about this uh, man who's a preacher who sort of comes to realize that um, he has all those um, beautiful things around him and he doesn't quite know how he got them and he becomes increasingly confused and agitated. Um, uh, and it's just a cool song. So I, I, uh, I picked it actually because I wanted to reinterpret the question <clears throat> from what will the world of tomorrow look like to what will it feel like. Uh, so what would it feel like um, to live in a world um, that, is, that is vastly different, uh, that's high sort of ambiguity? And I think what the, the song, the emotion that the song conveys to me is a sort of deep ambivalent uh, sense of bewilderment, wonderment, uh, amazement, and, and sort of agitation uh, that I think... Um, I expect sort of a world with a lot of uh, displacements and uh, sort of frictions and sort of uh, ambiguity uh, will create a very different experience for people. Um, and so I was trying to get at, at that sort of more feeling experience of the world of tomorrow uh, through that song. So if you haven't listened to it recently, go do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can find it and play it as we close up. Yeah, I was uh, <laughs> going to put the audio in, but uh, I thought it would be too much. No? Yeah, we'll find it later. Okay, so moving on to our second question, which is from Mark Hoffman. Um, and what is the role of imagination in today's research? Of course, they all sent us an image before they had the, the benefit of our artist talk. So we're going to talk about things like that over the last couple of days. So you can imagine what you want to imagine. And then we'll move on to the second question, which is from Mark Hoffman. And what is the role of imagination in today's research? Of course, they all sent us an image before they had the benefit of our artist talk. So things like that over the last couple of days. So you're allowed to change course should you need to, but you've uh, still got your image there. So Kevin is starting us off. All right. So uh, this is a fractal image that I made, and um, I didn't know uh, how it was going to come out when I started. Um, this is an example of kind of coming to an endpoint through computation, through emergence. Um, I didn't know what parameters to stick in the mathematical equation that drew the fractal that would give me that shape. Uh, so it was emergent and experimental. I probably generated a couple hundred images before I found one uh, that I liked. And um, I think that'll in part be the nature of how um, uh, research uh, in both the physical and social sciences will, will move into the future. That it will combine uh, both the, the qualitative and quantitative nature of, of the world. Um, that it will rely increasingly more heavily, he, more heavily on simulation and, and computation, and that part of our discovery process um, will be emergent and experimental. And so we can't necessarily know um, what we're looking for, but when we find something that's interesting, we'll point our finger and say, I created that. I don't know how I created it. I couldn't recreate it, but there it is. <laughs> I like the heavenly yeah. computation. <laughs>
Um, so Wendy, we've got yours next with yeah. this. Okay. Imagination. <laughs> Guess what I was thinking. <laughs> um, what I was thinking was that um, it, it's going to be so important for us to imagine um, and project a new future in our research. Um, we have a lot of talk about the future here, uh, and we're going to need, uh, but we're going to need imagination that's tethered to reality. <coughs> so, <laughs> so the idea that uh, we. Unlike fantasy, we need the as-if kind of version of the future where we have some, uh, some connections to what really exists around us, but we're going to have to really work hard at imagining a future that can incorporate um, sort of the, the climate change that we're facing today. Keep rolling forward um, and close. I would have never thought that there's such a seamless transition between a goat and cow like but, uh, <laughs> there is. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so thank, thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. Uh, um, so this is Carl Weick, um, who has been a uh, major influence on my scholarly life. Um, uh, even though we've never co-authored, I've had a very close relationship with him as a mentor when I was an, a, a graduate student. Uh, and he's really inspired a lot of what I aspire to in terms of um, how I would like to, to approach my work. Uh, one of his pieces that he wrote uh, is called uh, Theory Construction as Disciplined Imagination. Um, and it addresses exactly that point that we need imagination. And you know, his concern was with theory construction, which I, I do believe is central to what we do. Um, and he was emphasizing the imagination, but also uh, looking for ways to have the discipline that is necessary for that construction to be uh, impactful, powerful, and, uh, and sensible. Uh, and uh, he has a number of criteria for it, and, and they're, they're unconventional. They're not sort of external, internal validity and sort of, you know, causal identification. Um, it, they're, they're, they're things like um, it has to be developed from uh, a relatively accurate um, depiction of uh, multiple different um, settings and cases. Um, um, it should um, involve, the construction process should involve um, uh, diverse um, perspectives and angles. Um, um, and it should consider uh, multiple different outcomes. Um, and then you can sort of start winnowing it down. And that's sort of the discipline around the uh, the theory construction is primarily about representations of both the world of, of, uh, of the things we study and of other uh, sort of voices and perspectives. And that's how you sort of construct imagination that is um, uh, disciplined enough to sort of pass as, um, as what we think of as scholarship. Um, and I think that's a very um, a sort of powerful vision for me that sort of transcends a little bit the, uh, the normal debates that we have about sort of rigor and elegance and parsimony and, and all types of other things that, that people uh, emphasize. So it's imagination that's going to be disciplined. So, okay. so the image um, that, I'm, um, that I chose is a very famous photograph by uh, Berenice Abbott, a photographer based in New York in the 1930s who pioneered um, these type of uh, photographs. So when now we think about skylines, um, we are all in a way going back to her uh, pioneering photographs. And I realized that this is something that very much shaped how I think not only about Manhattan, but also about urban life and, 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 and cities in general, city life. Um, and so, so that's the image. Why did I uh, choose it? Well, I have to confess that I was initially a little bit skeptical um, when I was asked this question. Um, I'm an ethnographer. I oftentimes speak to um, finance scholars and economists, and, and some of them believe that ethnography is about telling stories or, or even making up stories. And, and clearly, that's not how I see my research. Um, so uh, there's the imagination component, but there, there, there's also the component of being tethered to the facts and, and the discipline. And so at, at first I, I thought that there was little that I could speak to. But then I went back to my own first project that then led to the book. Um, and I realized that it was, it was really because of my repeated encounters 
with the visual image of the Trade Center, of the Twin Towers, as I was walking daily from West 4th uh, Subway Station to uh, Washington Square, uh, where the Business School of NYU, where I was studying, was located, um, I would see the, the towers every day, in the morning and then in the evening, and it would look like this. And it's an image that really invites you to think about life inside. What's going on there? What are the people who are living in those rooms doing? And the same went for the Trade Center. And so it was that curiosity and impetus and imagine life um, that I developed after these encounters that led me down the path of doing an ethnography on one of those derivatives trading floors. So, so I thought I would choose this image. I'm going to ask you guys to chime in a little bit if you mm. want on each other, but mm. first I thought I might just, because this question is so particularly suited, um, go to our two artists who are, I think, two still in the room. If you had any comments, I wanted to, on, on <laughs> what you've heard, don't feel compelled, but just give you an, an opportunity if you want to. I'll, I'll think on it. Okay, okay, no pressure. <laughs> I wanted to maybe, uh, do we have time to react to, to Yeah, to, yeah, uh, absolutely. I just wanted to see, you're, you're good for now? Okay, good, I didn't want to pressure. Yeah, absolutely, please react. Yeah. Um, no, I thought what you said was very interesting and in, in sort of, um, you know, thinking of the imagination beyond what we as, as humans sort of, you know, sort of do um, and think of, uh, you know, part of the imagining process can be, you know, simulations, um, you know, things where we don't quite know how they understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, or how they actually work and, and sort of uh, make sense of that. Um, and I hadn't thought of that as being part of it. I thought it's all in here, you know. Um, and so I think it's actually a very interesting uh, way of looking at it. So, uh. I've, I've never, never really understood at the beginning of a research project what was the outcome going to be. Yeah. So for me, there's always a surprise component to it that sort of uh, the, the role of the imagination, you know, is, is starting out and then being able to keep up with what the world is telling you back. And so uh, for me, the outcome is, is always a, a richer and more surprising than I would have imagined at the odds onset. All right, so let's move on to the, uh, the big question. Can academia create a different world? And I just, uh, I think Nicholas really challenged us on this the other day, a question that I think troubles all of us. Uh, you know, are we part of the problem or part of the solution? Um, so we're very curious to, to hear what you guys uh, have thought here. And um, Wendy, you somehow mm -hmm. randomly have gotten to go first again. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I was thinking about um, academia, and, and um, the, the first picture is a picture of um, All Souls College in Oxford, and for me, it just embodies this beautiful, isolated ivory tower. It's not really how it works, I know, but I thought a lot about how cloistered we can be in academia and how um, so at a remove from the world that we can be, and that's that. of course, that's not the way to, to, to have an impact. Uh, and I've sort of gotten my, I think, my best ideas when I've been engaged in the world and I was trying to make sense of what was happening right there. And so sort of engagement is, a, is sort of a crucial way of, of, I think, being a good academic, but also you know, being outward looking. The other picture is, is, of course, she has to make a comeback, Greta. Uh, uh, we, the, there my point is simply that um, we can't be recluses in our ivory tower. We really need good allies. And that um, we can have all the knowledge in the world, but if we don't have political allies to help diffuse that knowledge, or if we have the kind of people who deny that <coughs> knowledge exists, as we're facing in my country, um, we won't have an impact. So um, the crucial role that having um, collaborating uh, across the academic world with um, the sort of world of politics and the world of policy is really, um, really, really crucial if we're going to have an impact. And uh, Greta Thunberg's position is um, humanity is facing an existential crisis due to climate change. The current generations of adults is responsible for climate change. Climate change will have a disproportionate effect on young people. <coughs> Too little is being done, and politicians and decision makers need to listen to the scientists and to the scholars and the artists, I would say. So, um, so that's, uh, it's through that kind of engagement across boundaries that I think we can hope to have an impact. Okay, so close. Um, the, can I get email created? I guess I'm sort of the portrait person. Yes, yeah. you definitely have a team. black and white. So, uh, yeah. so this is uh, Max Weber uh, mm -hmm. with the 
recently again fashionable beard. Um, <laughs> the, um, the reason I picked that picture is, is twofold. One is um, I think the, uh, the answer to can academia create, create a different world? You know, let's ask um, has academia contributed to the world as it is? Um, and I think the answer is pretty clear yes, right? If that's the case, then it can also create a different world, um, not single-handedly, but it's obviously part of it and a pretty important part. Uh, so the question is more how, um, and sort of what is the, what's the right role for us to play? Um, and interestingly, I mean, I, I've sort of found myself in recent years on the other end to where I was on those points earlier in my life, where I think, um, what we do is pretty unique in that it is uh, one step removed from uh, direct political interests. It's uh, at least one step removed, I hope. Um, it's more abstract. Um, it's less in the day. Uh, it's designed to, or what we can do is uh, give deeper thoughts, um, more thorough, but however slow sort of um, insights. Um, and I think in order to do that, uh, there needs to be an element of ivory tower. Um, mm -hmm. And I would have never thought that I would say that, um, but I, I feel we need both. Um, I think it's very important for us to engage, to have impact, to seek impact, uh, to take stances. Um, um, but we cannot credibly do that, um, and we cannot do it without undermining the very authority on which our impact rests without retaining a little bit of ivory tower, because um, that's what gives us the authority to speak with some, some grounding and some impartiality, which I think is why people listen to scientists. Um, and so I, I think, I, I hear a lot of people call for more immediate uh, sort of action, and I think that is very true. Um, I think there needs to be a second role that we play uh, and I, I think those roles ought to be separate um, of um, knowledge creation that is not necessarily or maybe shouldn't be directly linked to immediate pressing problems and there needs to be a translation process but um, I think there is a, a space for, for the, um, the other end. The reason why I picked uh, Max Weber for that is because of an essay that he wrote as, on science as vocation where he pleads for a um, science that aspires to be impartial and somehow removed. I don't think he argues that it can be or it will be. Uh, I think he argues that we should um, hold that up as an ideal and nevertheless engage in the world, but with that in mind that the reason why we, we, we scholars and scientists are not activists and politicians is because we have a different contribution to make that is equally important and valid. So, um, Daniel, with this fascinating illustration. Thank you. Um, so, uh, this is the cover of um, a finance journal from 1971, um, and it's illustrating um, an article written by Fisher Black, who went on to uh, who authored the article on the Black Scholes formula that went on to win the Nobel Prize. But in addition to that huge contribution of the Black and Scholes formula, um, Fisher Black also uh, theorized how would it, how would a, a fully automated exchange, like a stock exchange, look like uh, back when this was entirely the realm of science fiction. And I, I think that you can see from the from the uh, image that that truly at that time this was something that it was difficult to imagine. So you see this uh, quirky robotic sort of like image. Um, the reason why I I chose it is well, Fisher Black and the Black and Scholes formula, of course, was the object of the seminal uh, empirical study on performativity by um, Donald McKenzie and Yuval Milo. Um, and it illustrates this idea of performativity, which is one major way, I think, in which academics can have an influence on the world. And if you accept the premise uh, developed by Michel Calon that um, markets hinge upon material objects and devices, equations, formulas, algorithms uh, to function, and that those in turn 
are often based on theories and models developed by academics, then one can start to see that relationship. And in fact, I had the personal opportunity to see this um, very clearly as I did a project on the automation of the New York Stock Exchange. So this image, in fact, at some point in the, um, after 2006, actually began to take shape. And I was able to see the many ways in which the thinking behind how an exchange should look like, free of uh, social relations, free of personal factors, aim squarely at avoiding biases and favoritism. And then, of course, the problems that that created, uh, these heavily economic ideas about you know, the, the downside of the social and the ways in which it led to instability and, 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 and crashes. So I thought I would put this up. Excellent. Fantastic. I have no idea who did art. <laughs> um, Kevin, wrapping us up on this one, can academia create a different world? So um, I agree with my colleagues that I think that over history, academia has shown that through its research processes, it could create inventions that do change the world, and, and that will certainly continue. Um, I took a different take, though, because this didn't say how does research change, but how does academia change? And as I began to think about my own career, I've been so lucky to have the ability to have such uh, broad uh, impact on industry practice through the sustainability consortium. Um, but I'm not sure, even with all that, that that would outweigh the impact that I've had with my students over 32 years, the thousands of academic students, the thousands of industry people um, that, I've, uh, that I've helped train. And um, Dell Computer came to, to ASU a couple of years ago and asked, what is the impact in terms of the sample development goals of online education? And of course, our mind first jumps to the environmental impact, right? So there's less of a physical footprint. People don't have to drive to campus. We can increase class sizes, and so there's efficiencies in terms of teachers to students. Um, but that wasn't that was trivial compared to what we found was really the biggest impact, which is access. Um, right now, Arizona State University has 140,000 students. Um, just a couple of years ago, we were at 80,000. We have 50,000 online students. That includes about 8,000 students from Starbucks. Um, if you work at a Starbucks anywhere in the world, you can get a free online ASU degree. Um, and we're doing similar with Uber and have done similar with the U.S. military, um, where anyone involved in those organizations uh, can get an online degree for free. Um, our president, actually, um, I've heard rumors that he has said, well, if we can teach 50,000 students online, clearly we can teach a million. And, you know, uh, a college degree is one of the, the best predictors of lifetime income. And if we can increase access to people who would never otherwise be able to come to a campus and get a degree, um, then we're impacting their livelihood uh, across their lifetime. But it's not just more degrees, right? So we have, in business schools, we have this executive education. And I put quotes because pra practically no one in the executive education is actually an executive. But it sounds good, right? Um, but when I was in engineering, um, they called it continuing education. And I actually think that's more aspirational. Because it's not just about getting a degree or getting a degree and then getting a certificate sometime later, later on. But it's about a new system whereby people are learning continuously and are facilitated in that learning in some type of structured, uh, customized uh, manner. Um, so I think that our ability to change the world is to think about our ability to educate, our ability to expose people to new ideas, not just in our coursework, in our curriculum, but think about things that we can add to our university systems that in fact begin to get towards a real vision of truly continuous education. Oh, 
fantastic. I agree entirely. Um, I know we have some very passionate teachers in the room as well. I would like to speak to Klaus's point um, because this year, well, for for the last few years, I've been working a lot with Indigenous issues, and this year in particular, in Canada in particular, because we're in the reconciliation year, uh, the theme for the whole year of activity has been silence. And I think that as academics, we absolutely take our voice for granted. And what I'm learning to do is the value of both silence and being silenced, even if that has been as a result of the oppression, and what, what breakthroughs can happen as a result of those who have been silenced regaining their voice. So there are so many powerful dynamics we had had moments, uh, linking back to your point with the students, in which the students at, at a school like Ivy have asked us for more uh, post-colonial and even anti-colonial modes of, of knowledge building and teaching, which of course we're all trying to develop, but we're not there yet. The reason why I want to put this point on the table as our collective imagination requires us to engage topics that go far beyond our individual ability to voice. Um, I think we need to learn to listen. And I think we need to learn to listen in a very different way. Um, to learn to listen to, not, not just to see things differently, but to hear things differently. To pay attention to voices that we may have screened out or we don't understand or that make us thoroughly uncomfortable and and to to really to really exercise our prerogative as conveners, not necessarily as speakers, not necessarily as point of authority, but at points of translation, at points of facilitation, bridge break. That there are so many opportunities that once we <clears throat> once we step down our our societally appointed role as teachers, we can teach so much more effectively by being the learners. May I quickly respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I, I, I think the, to me the essence of what academia and in particular research is, is a form of listening. Um, now, there, there's obviously good forms of doing that and, and, you know, more biased forms of that. And I totally agree that, you know, the, uh, we don't have all the voices um, and we have methods that sort of um, don't allow us to hear voices. Uh, uh, but in, in, in I, I truly believe that in essence, we, we, our, our research task is listening. Um, I, I do think the convening is important, um, but we're neither unique in the, in the ability to do that, uh, nor are we terribly good at it without the backdrop of knowledge generation being our goal. And I think my main concern or my main, um, my main plea is that we, as academia, we can and we need to maintain our independence. Um, and not be influenced by the dominant voices. I think that's more my concern. And so if I look at teaching, I think teaching is very impactful. Um, but we have to be careful not let what we teach being determined by the people that give us money um, or by the people that dictate us what is important, um, but that we have an independent voice and we can actually bring those other voices to the fore. I think that, that that's what I meant by, you know, sort of the the ivory tower being sort of uh, independent of those in power, not necessarily not listening to those without. So. But obviously there's a danger in both, right? I mean, it's, it's very easy to be complacent and sit back in the armchair and say, hey, I know everything, you know. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so, yeah. um, oh, Tom, oh, sorry. sorry, I just sort of mentioned that I tried to get some PhD students, so just in case they had some ideas, I don't want to miss them, and I'll come back to you for no sure, but just in case they had some burning thoughts here. Yeah. Um, 
I want to ask about the challenges because we are in a group in this room. I think it's uh, selective buyers, you know, very people <laughs> research on sustainability care about that. Do you have that challenging uh, process when you do research or uh, teaching in, in this topic in your institution? And how do you work through that? Or even in a broader audience, like criticism, frustration? Yeah, lots of frustration. I'll jump in with a. So, um, one of the things that I have realized just from this venue here, um, because, you know, uh, even if I go to a big business conference, I'm hanging out with the supply chain management people. And, and in industry, when we interact with industry, I'm hanging around with the sustainability team and the supply chain people. And uh, that's not the composition of this room, right? Even, even just with, even without the artists, this is a very diverse uh, set of, of disciplines and opinions. And uh, I'm now convinced, it never occurred to me, but uh, convinced that if an undergraduate or graduate student um, wants to learn about sustainability, um, that they absolutely need to get multiple perspectives um, from multiple different disciplines. In our school of sustainability, that's kind of designed to do that already. Um, but when you're in engineering or business or a specific discipline and you're learning sustainability, those courses are going to tend to be very discipline specific. And I can see now um, how confining that could be in terms of imagination and creativity. And that uh, this is one area that just absolutely screams for interdisciplinary exposure and learning. Fantastic. Any last student comment? I saw a lot of nods over there. Are you guys, yeah? So I, I have a question for all of you because I, the university where I did my PhD, so the University of Groningen is now restructuring many programs to have more interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research and it's coming maybe from from the fear of having the greatest generation requiring completely different um, research. And then we have also conservatives that say, well, we really need fundamental research. And, and, and it's true because it's also where Greta is drawing from. So she's always advocating science. So I wonder how do you see in your institutions uh, the strength if you, if you are afraid of changes from your target users or your, your, uh, your clients, your students, your students. I can speak to that. Um, uh, one of the challenges of interdisciplinarity, which uh, I think is fundamental and crucial, though, is, is it's so easy to talk past each other. It takes a long time to really come to appreciate a different di discipline's methodology and to understand what their, you know, their theory is or even the language that they're using. So I think it's really important to have sustained relationships of interdisciplinarity. It's very difficult. I mean, I agree with you, Kevin. Uh, this this forum has been a wonderful place for kind of re, uh, reasserting the importance of interdisciplinarity, especially around issues of sustainability. But I think the other kind of lesson to learn is that you need sustained involvement um, with people from other disciplines, not only to gain respect, but so that you can even speak a common language. And that requires, I think, a big investment. So. Um, so it, what that can look like, it can look like workshops that are interdisciplinary where you have a commitment to an intellectual community, or it can look like interdisciplinary units within the university, or it can even look like teaching across your discipline within the, a given course. So uh, those are, those are I, I think it's very hard to do, but it, and it takes a long-term commitment, but certainly it's worth it. <laughs> Yeah, a number of us here work in uh, teaching an interdisciplinary course. Thomas, I'm curious. This is kind of a comment of clumsy, but everybody could address it if possible. I don't understand completely your differentiation between science and activism. So, do you consider that we can't be activists as such? Um, I think, um, you know, so I mean, I s sort of study activists, and I, and I think the, it, any one of us can be an activist, um, and I think many of us are in, in our own world, you know, I, I, 
sometimes can be an activist in my own school and so I'm trying to promote the things that I, I, I think are important. Um, um, but I'm first and foremost an academic um, uh, and I think to me the, the distinction comes down to as an activist I, I want to accomplish a relatively immediate outcome. I'm very goal driven. I'm very I have a, a, something that I know I, I need, I want, I, I advocate for. And then I think about ways how to get there. Um, and I think that to me is maybe not fully, but certainly mildly incompatible with uh, uh, my, my identity as a researcher, where I do not start with the outcome um, and then work backwards, how do I get there? But I start with an exploration and a, a seeking of understanding um, and the generation of sort of knowledge that will maybe inform my activism later, but is not directly linked to the accomplishment of a goal. So it's not instrumental in a narrow way. And I, I fully admit, I mean, it's not a distinction that everyone shares or, or understands. Um, and I do think there is, there's clearly a role for academics to become activists and they're very publicly visible activists. Um, I just don't think that role is viable without sort of a, a backbone of research that is uh, does not have that flavor. Um, so if you look at larger academia as a, as a part of society, um, I don't think climate scientists would have any authority if they didn't have sort of basic research backing them up. Um, and so they, they would be activists like anyone else and people wouldn't give them much credibility. Um, so I think it's important, I think, for us to understand the importance of having the some people in our community doing stuff that is what we call fundamental or even esoteric. Uh, and, and I think that's part of our system and, and part of what is unique about academia. And so it's not incompatible at a personal level. I think at an institutional level, I, I, I see a tension. No, Daniel wanted to chime in there too, and then we've just got about 15 minutes for the last one. Yeah, so very, very quickly. I think it's a, it's a really important question, um, activism versus science. So I just wanted to share my own dilemmas as I approached the world of responsible investment um, back in the um, early uh, parts of this decade. So what I found was that there was a remarkable amount of um, scholars who wanted to contribute to the spread of responsible investment. And the way in which they sought to do that was by empirically attempting to establish that the returns uh, that come out of responsible investment are the same as the financial returns from mainstream investment. And, um, <coughs> and I, something that always troubled me was, well, if, if, if they are so actively committed to um, help the cause through the research, how are they going to handle the many subjective judgment calls that you have to make um, in order to do rigorous work? And um, over the years, there's been a slight uh, perception <coughs> of this research, although it has produced about 250 studies um, the majority of which established that, yes, it, they do produce the same returns. Somehow, there has been a, a, a gap in, in the credibility of those, of those studies. So, so I, I really found myself in a dilemma there, because uh, whether to engage or not in that really spoke to that divide. And um, I guess I just wanted to uh, share that situation. Okay, maybe just one last one. I know we probably want to move on. Uh, one, one important form of um, academic conduct that I think is, is part of what I would, I would think of as the sciences as vocation is, is, um, uh, is the ability to critique um, and the ability to articulate and voice critiques of existing uh, systems. And that's not always empirical. I mean, I think of many of the, the, certainly the social movements and the social change advocacies that have, you know, happened over the last, you know, probably 100 years, originated from, you know, people in academia that articulated um, critiques of existing systems of capitalism, of, um, you know, of environmental degradation. And uh, they didn't directly go out and say, now you've got to do this or that. 
but they took the the liberties afforded by the independence of the institution and the ability to speak against powers uh, to articulate that. And then other people picked it up and sort of, um, you know, did the more what I think of as sort of more street or political activism. And so it's not that they weren't sort of connected to it, but it was in a slightly different way. So plus you're actually first on our next one. I so can you just continue on. right into that. So yes. yeah, if we can't keep these ones and this is actually, minute or so, that we can have a couple yeah. of questions. Yeah. yeah, I actually saw the last two questions as very connected. Yeah, um, too, and so good. I'm at the risk of sounding like I'm going to contradict myself. I think <laughs> the, we do want the science as vocation, but it only works on the flip side if... Um, how should we produce the knowledge? And that goes back to, to Anna's point about sort of listening to um, silenced voices or finding silenced voices and then bringing them out. Um, I think it's, it's important to think very carefully what we study um, and sort of how we listen to that, uh, that, that we study. Um, and this is why I, I, I really couldn't come up with a good um, graphic for that. But the, so I picked the SDGs, which sort of always works. Um, but, you know, if I look at um, what people in my world, sort of a business school world and management world study, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very narrowly focused on a few of those, primarily economic value creation. <laughs> um, and we don't study many of the other things. And we, we, so it, I think it's, it's really important to go out and... Um, generate knowledge about things that um, um, are not represented well. Um, and by generating knowledge about them, uh, we bring them to the fore, we make it more visible, and we, we might enable you know, subsequent action. And so I, I think if we want to sort of change the world of tomorrow, um, we, we have to sort of diversify what we actually look at. So. Yeah, so I chose just the cover of, um, uh, of a book, uh, one of my very favorite ethnographies by uh, Mitchell Malafia on uh, Wall Street. Mm -hmm. and, and I chose it because it speaks to uh, the question that I faced as I turned to try and understand the financial crisis, which is that I was clearly coming at it from uh, a position of moral outrage. And as I, as I faced the question of how to do research and how to stay with my uh, moral engagement um, without letting that get me in the way of my process, my research, I stumbled upon a, a very unique situation where I was able to follow actors on Wall Street who themselves were morally outraged. And so that allowed me to um, stay connected to that uh, moral emotion while at the same time um, have the necessary empathy to, to actually accomplish the field work and the interviews and the listening. And so I guess this is just um, a call for um, morally committed and morally um, engaged research. So it's a vicarious moral outrage? I suppose uh, that's part of it. I like that. And uh, Kevin, yeah, and I know you've been talking a lot about teaching. Feel free to morph that knowledge for tomorrow's world if you want. Well, I might have answered more probably accurately how how will knowledge or knowing be produced um, in the future. I think as as academics, um, our information base has so drastically increased. Um, if I compare what our PhD students have to learn in terms of all the theories, all the different disciplines, all the different methods just to be, just to follow the norm. It's a much heavier cognitive load, and a load that can't, we can't feasibly expect to be finished in four or five years. Um, so it gets back to the, the continuous learning. Um, and we have so many journals, um, and now people are tweeting and writing blog posts, and so there's just an overwhelming amount of information, but it not only applies to us, it applies to everyone. And in that information overload context, um, you need mediation. You need filtering. Um, some of that filtering will be very positive uh, for us. Some of it we already see can be very negative. So right now, you know, I've, I've lived through the transition of seeing our news transform to a situation where, for example, if you had a politician on from one party, 
you know, for five minutes. You had to give equal access to the other party for five minutes. Um, and every station had pretty much the same news, and then they gave a little editorial spot at the very end for 90 seconds to the, the head newscaster. Um, today we have news that is mediated and filtered for our own particular interests and biases. Not just political interests and biases, but if we don't want to watch news and we want to watch the cooking channel for 24 hours, <laughs> we can do that too. And with AI, you know, and in that, in that um, movie with Tom, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, where he's shown kind of walking in front of that, uh, some big signpost that's empty, and then as soon as he walks past it, a customized advertisement pops up. That's happening. There's, I just read there's a company that's making shoes, and they're putting tags in the shoes so that when you walk by kiosks, it will pop up customized advertising. So we are going to see with AI, right now, you know, you can set your own filters, right? You have some control to some extent over what you see, what information you get. Um, in the future, that's going to become more and more mediated by other parties. Um, and that customized knowledge um, at first, you know, it's a good endorphin hit because it's, it knows what gets our attention. Um, but we're probably going to be less, even though with that wealth of information there, we're probably going to be less exposed to a variety of viewpoints and a variety of information and data that would be healthier. Great. Thank you. And there's a nice juxtaposition, I think, with Wendy's, uh, your you were punished by going first every time. And you get to wrap this up. <laughs> okay. So I like the contrast between those two yeah, slides. Yeah. Um. Well, I'd like to first say something in response to, to Anna, which is um, I think it's really important that we conduct research that shows how certain voices are eliminated and are suppressed. Um, and so that, that's part of our responsibility. That's part of our, should be part of our moral, um, our moral framework when we're, when we're academics, especially sociologists. And I also really like Ju Jung's point about um, the importance of uh, she describes it in terms of a sociological imagination, but you know, a way of uh, conveying to people that um, that what they're experiencing isn't a personal problem. It's it's a it's a problem related to big structural forces that's going to require lots of people to attack it. Um, so I think um, those are two important things um, when we're thinking about research. Uh, the reason I chose this slide was because I think the kind of work that we're going to do in the future uh, has got to be collaborative. And this is a slide of, you know, so, so supposedly all scientists in white coats looking at how to grow something. But, oh, sorry. Nope. Um, but um, I think what we're d desperately going to, of course, need the STEM work that shows us a, a lot of the underlying conditions related to climate change and how things work. But we're also going to need to engage with um, social scientists and policy makers and, and, uh, and artists as a way to sort of produce knowledge that can be disseminated and meaningful and have a shot at being implemented. So for me, uh, collaboration is sort of the name of what we, what we should be doing in our research. Uh, and that's, it's, you know, kind of goes along with interdisciplinarity, which we were talking about earlier, is that multiple perspectives um, are sort of going to be crucial to solve these really huge problems that we face. Mm -hmm.